All right, this is a, uh, this string of texts that you have from verse 5 all the way down to verse 14 is a little bit difficult to navigate, but if you remember this, all of these Old Testament texts that he's using are either about the sun or they're about angels. And in this whole text, he's contrasting the sun and the angels. And if you go back to verse 4, he's saying that the sun has become better than the angels and he has a more excellent name than the angels. Okay, so verse 6, when he brings the firstborn into the world, um, David was called God's firstborn, God's preeminent one in Psalm 89, 25 and 26. Jesus is now God's firstborn that he brings into the world. So God says, let all the angels of God worship him. The angels are the worshipers. The son is the one being worshipped. But of the angels, he says, he makes his, his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Um, be sure that you write spirits there instead of winds because he's going to refer to this text uh, that he quotes in verse 7. He's going to refer to it in verse 14 where he calls the angels ministering spirits. Uh, this text in verse 7 is actually Psalm 104, verse 4, see? And he's referring again to Psalm 104, verse 4, in verse 14, where he says the angels are ministering spirits. Well, if you translate this winds instead of spirits, you mess that up, that connection up, see, that he's obviously making if you read um, the Greek text. So the angels are spirits, and they are ministering spirits. The word ministering, uh, you'll notice there in the, on the screen, is not the word diakonia or, or diakonos, minister, like we have in most places in the New Testament. It's leiturgos, which means priestly ministers. And in the book of Hebrews, the angels are priestly ministers in the um, true tabernacle in heaven. You know, so it's a different word even uh, that is used here. So he makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So the angels are ministering spirits. That's who they are, but they are not the sun. They are not God's enthroned king. Verse 8 Let's go back and talk about the Son and who He is. But to the Son, in other words, God says to the Son. And this passage is Psalm 45, 6 and 7. So He says, but to the Son, He says, your throne, O God. See, He calls the Son God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You could translate that word uh, straightness or correctness or uprightness. So this king is an upright king. This king is a righteous king. See, the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your rule. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. See, verse 9, which is quoting... Um, this psalm, Psalm 45, this, this verse 9 is giving the reason why God anointed Jesus as king. And that reason is because in his earthly life, he loved righteousness and he hated lawlessness. He demonstrated that by his conduct. All right? Therefore, it says, that is because you loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, for this reason, God anointed you, even your God anointed you, with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Uh, your companions, your fellows, seem to be the angels. But God anointed the Son 
uh, as king over the angels, made, them, made him greater and better than the angels because he came to earth and he loved righteousness and he hated lawlessness and he truly lived as a faithful son. And for that reason, see, because he was righteous and faithful and loved righteousness, God anointed him to be king over all, the, all things. And then you simply have at the beginning of verse 10, you have the word and. So if you'll look at the introduction to verse 8, he says, to the son, he says, and then he gives you the quote. And then in verse 10, he says, and, now he's introducing an additional quote about the son. See, this also is about the son. This one comes from Psalm 102, verse 25 through 27. So what does he say to the son in this one? And you, Lord, notice in verse 8, he says, your throne, O God. And now he says, and you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth. Again, he pictures the son as creator. And the heavens are the works of your hands. Uh, they shall perish. See, the heavens and the earth shall perish. But you will remain. They shall grow old like a garment. Like a mantle, you shall roll them up. Like a garment, they shall be changed. But you are the same, and your years shall not fail. Notice the last part of that. You are the same, and your years will not fail. Look at verse 8. 11 at the beginning where he says they the heavens and the earth shall perish but you will remain see so here the son is not only given a a kingdom because of his righteousness but he was there in creation and unlike the heavens and earth he's going to remain forever see this is just way exalted great wonderful things that are being said about the son all right, and it's, it's exploring his greatness, much like John chapter 1 does, perhaps even in more detail than John chapter 1 does. And then he presses it further, but to which of the angels did he ever once say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? And of course, the answer to that is the same answer we had uh, back up here in verse 5 where he says to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son well he didn't say that to any of them and so you get down here to verse uh, 14 or 13 he says but to which of the angels did he ever once say and of course he didn't say this to any of the angels and here he quotes sort of the centerpiece of the passages upon which the book of Hebrews is built he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. In that psalm, he says, sit at my right hand. Uh, the, the psalm actually begins, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay? We're going to talk in detail about that passage because it is sort of the linchpin passage of the book of Hebrews. Now he shifts back to the angels. They were not enthroned at God's right hand. But they, are they not all ministering spirits? Uh, the word ministering is liturgica, which goes back to verse 7, to this word liturgus, see his ministers. And they are ministering spirits. Uh, the citation in verse 7 says he makes his angels spirits. And, of course, that's Psalm 104, verse 4. And his ministers a flame of fire. By the way, these quotations are from the Greek Old Testament, from the Septuagint. Which shows you that he's talking to an audience that speaks Greek. And... Uh, or maybe he himself is a, is a Greek-speaking Jew. So they, the angels, are ministering spirits sent forth, 
See, they're sent by God to do service. That's diakonion. See, they're going to serve or minister to, it says, those that shall inherit salvation. So the angels are sent to minister to us, the people of God, the people of Christ. But Christ himself is God. He is the Son. He is the one enthroned over all. He is the one who has become by so much better than the angels and has inherited a more excellent name than they. All right, so what's the point of all this? Well, the point is that if Christ is so much greater than the angels, he's going to say, then the message that was spoken through Christ is much more important than the message that was spoken through the angels. Okay, let's see what we're going to do from here. Yeah, this is the um, chart, and you might take a photograph of this. This is where I'm, I'm demonstrating that in um, verse 14, where he says they're ministering spirits, he is actually taking those two words from verse 7, see, and uh, bringing that same point out again. Um, you may not realize this, but the, the format of this book of Hebrews is extremely Jewish. It's, it's like Jewish exposition. It's putting these passages out there and then talking about those passages. And uh, it's, it's very effective, and it's what the guy is doing in this book. All right. So... Beginning Hebrews chapter 2, and of course you've got to remember that there were no chapters, so the discussion just goes right on here, for this reason. All right, what reason? Well, since Christ is so much greater than the angels, since he has become better than the angels, has been uh, given a more excellent name than the angels, has been enthroned above all the angels and everything else, for this reason. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now, we, here in Hebrews 2, verse 1, is the same as us in Hebrews 1, verse 2. See, let's remember Hebrews 1, 1, and 2. In many parts, in many ways, in ancient times, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to who? He has spoken to us by his son, who is, of course, much greater than the angels. For this reason, we must pay much more close attention to what we have heard. Who did we hear it from? Well, we have heard it from his son, see? So that we do not drift away from it. Well, see, those people that heard the message that came to the fathers by the prophets back then, they drifted away from that message. Now, we've heard a message through the Son. We need to pay close attention to that message so we don't drift away from it, which was exactly what was going on in the book of Hebrews. They were tending to drift away from Christ and Christianity because of pressure and struggle uh, from the Jewish community. And I notice he begins to compare the message spoken through the angels to the message that has been spoken through Christ. So, um, y'all pause the tape right now, and one of you look up Acts 7, verse 53, and read that. And another one of you read Galatians 3, verse 19, and um, actually Acts 7, verse 38, and verse 53 and Galatians 3.19. And after you've read that, then unpause the tape, and let's start again. So, in those passages, in those passages, in Acts and in Galatians, uh, it is mentioned that in the giving of the Mosaic law, angels were involved. It was ordained by angels. See, we're not really told much about how were angels involved 
in the giving of the law? Is he speaking of the angel of the Lord who spoke to, to Moses through the bush? Is he speaking of some other angels? We don't know, but angels were involved, okay? And when he says here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels, he's talking about the Old Testament revelation. The Hebrews 1, verse 1 revelation in ancient times. That's the message that came through the angels. See, if, if that message was so steadfast and every transgression of that message back there and every disobedience of that message back there received a just recompense of reward, a just penalty. In other words, if you disobeyed that message, you were punished severely. Then if that's true about the message that was spoken through the angels, then how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation after it was at first spoken through the Lord? In other words, through Jesus. So you see Hebrews 2, verse 2 and 3 is a repeat of Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews 1, 1, the message that was spoken in ancient times to the fathers. See, Hebrews 1, 2, the message that was spoken through the Son. Hebrews 2, 2, the message spoken through the angels. Hebrews 2, verse 3, the message that was spoken through the Lord Jesus, the Son. Okay, same comparison. So if that message that came to them through the angels was so great that it was severely punished when they disobeyed it, how shall we escape? That's a rhetorical question. If we neglect such a great salvation after it was at first spoken to us by the Lord and it was confirmed unto us by those who heard him. Notice, those who heard him. Paul seems, or the, the writer of Hebrews seems to be outside of those who heard him. God also testifying to them, or with them, not with us, but with them. See, again, he, he puts himself outside of that group of apostles. God testifying to them both by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts uh, or measures of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The word for gifts here is not charismata, if you're studying spiritual gifts. It's merismois, uh, which means portions or measures. And you do find that word also in the discussions of spiritual gifts uh, in the Apostle Paul's writings. Like, for example, um, Ephesians 4, verse 7, and uh, Ephesians 4, 16, and other places, or, uh, Romans chapter uh, 12, verse uh, 3 and 4, okay? Those are some of the places you find that word. But the point here is, if they neglected the message that was spoken through the angels back in the Old Testament, then are we going to escape if we neglect the message that came through the Son, who has been made by so much greater then the angels, and the obvious answer to that is no. We're not going to escape if we neglect what has been spoken through the Son. We need to take it even more seriously than the message that was spoken through the angels. So when you look at bigger chunks of text, instead of looking at just itty-bitty tiny pieces of the text, um, you figure out that the reason why, at least one of the reasons why, he was making the comparison between Christ and the angels in chapter 1 is to show them that the message that came through Christ is so much more important and so much more consequential than the message that came through the angels. That's chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. But he's still not done um, comparing Christ and the angels because in verse 5 he says for it was not to angels that he subjected the world to come about which we are speaking now 
You see on the slide here, I've underlined the world to come concerning which we are speaking. All right? This is the Hebrew writer's way of speaking about the messianic age, the world to come about which we are speaking. Because from the perspective of the Old Testament, from the Jewish perspective, remember the Old Testament is their Bible. The messianic age is always being spoken of in the future, see? And it's known as the world to come, see? Or, or the age to come, all right? Uh, let me give you another one here that will compare. Look over at chapter 6 of Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 6 and look at verse 4. For it is impossible after we have been once enlightened and we have tasted of the heavenly gift and have, been, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and we have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. See, the age to come, that is speaking of the messianic age. And here in this passage that we have on the screen, the world to come about which we are speaking, that's speaking of the messianic age, the time when the Messiah would be enthroned and he would rule over God's people, see? But in the Old Testament... Every time the Jews read about that age, it was futuristic. It was in the future. So their terminology for it is the world to come, the age to come, see? And the writer of Hebrews is trying to get across that the age to come has arrived in Christ, okay? So um, this passage, still working with the comparison between Christ and the angels, God did not subject the messianic age, the world to come, to the angels. He did not appoint the angels as rulers, lords, masters over the coming age, over the messianic age. No, he enthroned the Messiah. He enthroned the Son as ruler, lord, king, master over the messianic age. All right? And this is where he introduces a... Another quote, which is a major quote that's now being discussed in, in Hebrews, and that is the citation from Psalm 8. So he says, but he testifies somewhere saying. Now, why doesn't he say uh, in Psalm 8? Well, um, we didn't have chapters and verses then, and we may have had uh, the Psalms uh, given a designation like that. I don't know, but... He just says, he testified somewhere saying. So you unroll the psalm scroll and you get to the point where you have what we call the eighth psalm and he, he has this quotation. Now, if you look back at Psalm 8, let's just turn to Psalm 8 for a minute. If you look back at Psalm 8. All right, let's start at verse 3 in the actual psalm. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor you have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. All right, now let's look at the quotation that's actually a quotation of Psalm 8, 5, and 6 here in Hebrews 2, beginning with verse 7. Look at the way it's put in um, Hebrews. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. 
and you have subjected or made all things subject under his feet. All right, now, in your ESV, I don't know what your New American Standard says in Psalm 8. Um, some Old Testament translations say in Psalm 8, verse 5, you have made him a little lower than God. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, this is... This is the citation here. Um, you have made him a little lower than the angels. Some translations say, some translations say you've made him a little lower than God. Now the word in the Hebrew text is Elohim. And Elohim sometimes refers to mighty beings like the angels. And in, evidently in this passage, the Elohim are the angels. In the Greek Old Testament... Uh, the Septuagint, it says you made him a little lower than the angeloi, the angels, okay? And in the book of Hebrews, this is a citation from the Greek Old Testament. Since the book of Hebrews is inspired, we believe God was talking about the angels as those mighty beings that he was made lower than. In the book of Hebrews, there's surely and strictly a comparison being made between Christ and the angels, but see, during his earthly life, he was made for a little while lower than the angels. Um, so, and this is going to be a big deal. Uh, you remember in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, after he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become by so much better than the angels. See, when he was down here living his earthly life, he was lower than the angels. But when he died and rose again, he was made better than the angels, given a more excellent name than the angels. So this passage is being used to talk about the incarnation and earthly life of Jesus Christ. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. Then you crowned him with glory and honor and put everything in subjection under his feet. Notice how similar that is to what's being said in um, Hebrews 1, verse 3 and 4, where it says, when he had made purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, having become by so much better than the angels in that he had inherited a more excellent name than they. All right. So, he says, you have made him for a little while lower than the angels, here in the quote. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You've appointed him over the works of your hands. And you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now on this chart here, on the, on the slide, I've highlighted the word subjection or subject. And you'll notice that occurring all through here. And if you'll go back to verse 5... He says in verse 5, he did not subject to angels the world to come. See, you have that word hupotasso, to subject, to put under subjection. And you have that same word in the quote here where he says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now in the psalm, it's talking about God put all creation in subjection to man. And he says, he's using that word here. And then the writer of Hebrews picks up on that word subject. And he begins to discuss that word in the quotation. Okay. For in subjecting all things to him. In this case, he's talking about the son. He left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So in the Jewish interpretation, this was just talking about creation. And this was talking about man as being the ruler over all the rest of creation. God had put everything in subjection under man. Man rules over all the rest of creation. But in the more spiritual or fuller meaning, the writer of Hebrews is saying, the psalm actually says that God literally put all things 
in subjection under his feet. And while the created things, you know, like the natural universe was certainly ruled over or managed by man, all things, literally all things, were not made subject to man because sin was not made subject to man and death was not made subject to man and Satan was not made subject to man. So not literally all things were subject to man, at least not yet, until Christ came. So he says, but we do see him, that is Christ, who was made for a little while lower than the angels. See, he's picking that phrase up from um, verse 7. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. And Jesus indeed was made for a little while lower than the angels. So we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. See, after he died and rose, he was crowned with glory and honor. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So see, Jesus is the one who overcame sin. Jesus is the one who overcame death. Jesus is the one that made sin and death subject to him and also came to rule over Satan and made Satan subject to him. So the writer of Hebrews is saying while man in general uh, was the ruler over creation, the natural creation, and that um, he was ruler over the fish and the birds and all that kind of stuff, the passage really wasn't completely made true until Jesus came along and literally all things were made subject under his feet. Okay? All right. Let's take another short break and we'll come back together again. <laughs> 